All right, folks, welcome to the Monsters Madness and Magic Podcast. I'm your host, Justin, here with a quick word before we dive in. Now, in this roundtable discussion, I'm joined by Howie Bentley of Cauldron Born, Jason Tarpy of Eternal Champion, and Deathmaster of Doom Sword to discuss their personal history with sword and sorcery, Richard Tierney's Simon of Gitta series, Paul Anderson's The Broken Sword, underrated gems within the genre, new projects from their respective bands, and more. As always, thank you all for listening out there. And if you'd like to help the show grow and you're listening on your podcasting platform of choice, please leave us a review. And if you happen to be watching the video on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe because it does help. Anyway, without further ado, here you go. All right, gentlemen. Well, thank you all again. Uh, before we dive deeper into some of the topics we had planned, uh, you know, just in case folks aren't familiar, this is their first time tuning in. Thought it'd be a good idea if we went around the Zoom room here and gave a like some brief insight into your introduction to the genre. So maybe uh, I guess we'll start with Howie, Jason, then we'll go Joe, and I'll round it out, and then we'll we'll be off to the races. You know, I, a, there are a number of things leading up to it, but um, mainly. Yeah, I was getting into uh, reading Savage Sword of Conan when I was um, a teenager in the 80s, in the early 80s. And then I saw that movie, John Millie says, Conan the Barbarian. And that really made me want to go out and find the, the paper. I'd seen the paperbacks in the store before so with the Frank Frazetta covers. And I picked those up. I guess it was Lance, um, Lance Ace paperbacks or Lancer. And uh, and just really got into reading that. At the same time, I was reading some sword and sorcery comic books. You know, my early teens in the '80s, like Arax on a Thunder, Arion Lord of Atlantis, and that kind of thing. And you know, the time I'm older than you guys, obviously. So the time I was growing up, these movies were coming out. I guess because of the success of uh, Milius, it's calling the Barbarian. There are all these other movies coming out too, like uh, the Sword of the Sorcerer. Uh, Beastmaster and and all these things too. So in a way, it was like for my father's generation. My father grew up in the forties and fifties, and there were always westerns on television, western serials, and and westerns on cinema. And and to a, a lesser degree, that was the way of it when I was growing up in the eighties. Was this sword and sorcery? And there were a lot of fantasy movies too. You know, like high fantasy and stuff like that, like Dragon Slayer and that kind of thing. But I was more into the hard as nails sword and sorcery and i would just pick up every back then things you know obviously it was um pre-internet days so you would take what you could find then you'd go into a store a bookstore and i was reading some of those conan pastiche novels and then a little bit later on i got into death dealer novels by uh, james silk it says james silk and frank frazetta on the covers but uh, anyway it just sort of uh Went from there and uh, really got into, I was really into heavy metal too at the time. So I decided to eventually put those two things together. And I won't go into all that. Maybe we'll <laughs> we'll talk about that later, but I want to give the other guys some right. time. To free, so I'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll move on. Jason Tarpey. Uh, so my introduction to the genre I, was similar to Howie's. Um, when I was a kid, I probably got a hold of the Conan comic books first or seen the Conan movies. I can't remember which was first. It's probably the movies, actually, now that I think about it, because comic books came after I was watching those type of movies. So I think the introduction was probably Conan the Barbarian, then Conan the Destroyer, and then uh, Beastmaster, Dungeon Master, uh, you know, all those movies. Roll. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> And so then I probably came the comic books and I don't think I was aware of the literature yet. I don't think, you know, I wasn't aware of Robert E. Howard in, in the genre as a whole. Like I kind of just was drawn to those movies and in the comic books, I wasn't so into the superhero thing. I kind of like how we looked for the, the Conan or the A-Rack or the, you know, the slightly the next tier barbarians. <laughs> yeah. uh, what do they call them? Uh, Clonans, yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so uh, I got into the comic books, and later I kind of I didn't re I wasn't a big reader, you know, even into my early twenties. So I kind of had that in the background. I really liked fantasy, but it was really just 
but that was the extent of it was movies and comic books. I was in a hardcore band called Iron Age before Eternal Champion. And we were really influenced by this band called the Icemen, who are a New York hardcore band. And they had a song called Shadow at a Time, which is the H.P. Lovecraft short story, of course. And the song was about that story, but I didn't really get it from the lyrics. I was like, what are these lyrics about? And so my friend actually knew about H.P. Lovecraft. And he was like, oh, songs about this writer. And I was like, oh, I thought that was a movie director. I think we talked about this yeah. before, Justin. Yeah. And so that was my introduction was finding Lovecraft and then finding out that him and Robert E. Howard were kind of part of the same circle. It was after Lovecraft that I went and read all the Conan stories and then found Brand Moore and, and all the other characters. I kind of just dove in head first. I didn't stop reading for like a decade after that, just absorbing everything. So Awesome. And how about yourself, Joe? What was your introduction? My introduction was really unusual. Uh, this movie called Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah I got hooked ju just the same way I would add um, Excalibur at a, um, uh, a real pull uh, and um, and I would even say that the Arthurian cycle itself uh, I don't know if you want to call it sword and sorcery it would be forcing the term um, although I think you could definitely call it fantasy, and it and it is going back in time a, a long, long way. Um, but yeah, that's Conan and Excalibur are the two movies that pulled me in. And then um, uh, Tolkien, I think it all snowballed at, at the same time. I like like Jason. I don't think I was a great reader, but then possibly because. I didn't really find anything that I was really interested in reading because then when I discovered Sword and Sword and Sword, Sword and Sorcery and Dungeons and Dragons and Heavy Metal, it all became one big <laughs> snowball that became an avalanche. <laughs> and that was it. All right. I'm, I'm going to sound like a broken record, you know, John Millius, Conan the Barbarian, but just like Jason, I would say my introduction was more from the horror side of things. I grew up in a lot of horror movies. So similar to Jason, I thought HP Lovecraft was a director till I start looking into it. You know, this guy's a writer friends with Robert Howard. And then you just kind of, you just kind of slide in the back door and you, you find Robert Howard, Clark Ashton Smith, and then you just go down the well. Another thing all you guys obviously have in common is on top, on top of sort of sorcery is your, your metal uh, background. So you implement the genres into your music. So can you each speak a little bit about, you know, the importance of sword and sorcery as it's expressed in your, in your music? It was really just a natural progression for me. Uh, it was like every band that I joined, I didn't, was in any really good bands, even, you know, like try to play in some cover bands and stuff. But my, my real goal was to form a, you know, a proper heavy metal band. And people kept, and I grew up in rural Kentucky, and everybody kept saying to me, "We need to move down further south, where all those heavy, you know, that people into all that heavy stuff like you are." And uh, people kept saying Atlanta, and I moved there in '88 to go to the Atlanta Institute of Music. And my idea was to form um, when I finished there to form the ultimate heavy metal band. To me, the ultimate heavy metal band, the band that I always wanted to hear myself. And I was into all these themes, and uh, I would always, you know, if we would start bands or whatever, I was always the lyricist. Nobody could write lyrics, and it really just was a matter of um, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. You know, <laughs> I could write lyrics a little bit and really got into that, and uh, I just wrote about stuff that I just naturally gravitated toward. I wasn't interested in mundane things like relationships and politics and social issues and all this crybaby stuff so i wanted to get into um kind of stuff I, I like to read about and i started writing lyrics like that and it and it just sort of snowballed to where i was doing more and more of that and and the more i did that and then the more attention i got for doing that then i kept reading more and more sword and sorcery until it just became this pure thing it was just sword and sorcery heavy metal and uh, and it's pretty much you know the same thing that um, that uh, Jason and, and Joe do with their bands um, is what I would call sword and sorcery heavy metal. So that um, that was is pretty much the story in a nutshell. 
Gotcha. Now, Jason, you said you started out in a punk band. What was the what was the thematic shift for you? Well, as a teenager, when you're in a like a hardcore band, your world is so small. You kind of write about your friendships as kind of a trope. You know what I mean? And maybe I did that for a while in my in my first band. And then by the time I got into Iron Age, I was like, I can't like how we said write about relationships, mundane life, politics. I, I like I shouldn't have any place telling anyone how to live. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the whole moralistic view of writing songs did, did, wasn't appealing to me. And so I kind of had to think about what kind of lyrics I like. And I like lyrics that have stories. You know, I think that songs can just be like a movie or a short story. And I'm thinking about the stories I like now. I'm reading uh, Robert E. Howard and Clark Ashton Smith, Lovecraft, Michael Moorcock. And as I'm forming Eternal Champion, the goal is just to write songs that you can follow along with the lyrics and kind of give homage to the story to pull you in. You know, it's a little bit of escapism, but it's also engaging. I mean, just because these songs are about, we'll call it sword and sorcery or fantasy, just because they're about other worlds doesn't mean they're unrelatable. They're still about humans. You know what I mean? They're just, um, they're people that we that we make up, that we see ourselves in or uh, see other people, our enemies. or You know, you can't help but kind of project yourself onto these stories. Or if you're a writer like we are, projecting yourself onto these characters so there's just a very human engaging element in writing about these stories they're so visceral and they're so emotional and that's kind of what music is good for is conveying emotions and that's kind of what these stories are full of even if it's like two emotions <laughs> like anger and <laughs> uh you know battle lust so you know what i mean it's yeah. just <laughs> Well said. You can't help but be like enthralled by it, and and so that was that was the goal I I saw. I was like, well, it's not only is it an homage to the genre which I love and in these stories which no one's really reading anymore. When Eternal Champion started, I was like, well, I can do that, and I can also for people who don't even care to read the story or care about the genre at all can also just be pulled in by the human or relatable elements of the stories. So that, that was the goal. Well said. How about you, Joe? Mainly it's escapism, uh, I have to confess. Like mm. when probably the world you live in, you're not quite satisfied with, you start dreaming of other worlds. Um, but um, as far as the actual influence of sword and sorcery in uh, Doom Swords music, I would say, the biggest influence was Michael Moorcock. Um, and I, I I found that that the the contrast of law and order and the hero of the story being a, a complete anti-hero was was the reason why it had such a heavy influence on on me because you go to write music, you go to to write lyrics. Uh, you 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 strive to communicate like a feeling, uh, which for me the the keyword is epic. Because above all, I mean, we can talk about sword and sorcery, fantasy, but the the keyword I associate with my music is epic. You 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 try and kind of picture yourself in certain situations, maybe living in uh, being a character in the story. I always thought I I, I wouldn't be a kind of Conan kind of type. <laughs> um, uh, I would be more, you know, the guy that um, ends up being a protagonist in the story, but maybe has some darker side to them and is not necessarily all out good. Um, but by, by all means, Conan wasn't, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, being, a, yep. being a kind of an archetype character, you know, he was all out something. Um, whereas um, Michael Moorcock, uh, I mean, the attractiveness of Elric compared to other characters is its complexity, other character complexity, and how Moorcock developed it. So, yeah, and that's that's why that's why it features so heavily, and not necessarily explicitly. I mean, like we we've done songs about uh, Elric, the 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 contrast of. Uh, order and chaos, inner conflict, 
uh, that's always present and it's more or less always deriving from from Moorcock. In fact, the last album we published a long time ago now is mm-hmm. called The Eternal Battle, which really just refers to your own yeah. internal battle that's never ending, right? So, yeah, that that's it, really. That I would that would be a, a summary of it. Joe, I can't believe I've never asked you this, but when you're growing up reading this stuff, are you reading in English? So that's that's a cool thing. Uh, oh, by the way, when I say that Moorcock influenced, um, I don't know if I ever said this. Uh, I I wanted to call the band Stormbringer, uh, but there was already. Uh, about a hundred million <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, a friend of mine uh, that run- nowadays runs a distribution called Iron Tyrant um, in in Italy. Uh, he had a, a much greater familiarity with the English language than I did back then, and a um, couple of days later, I don't I don't know where he goes. Uh, you know the way you were looking for a, you know, a band name that was basically you know, give me Stormbringer but not Stormbringer. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, "What about Doomsor?" Um, so uh, that's what I went with. But yeah, back to your question. There's a, a moment in time. So I moved to Ireland in 2004. Mm-hmm. So before then, I read and watched movies. Um, in Italian, didn't do any English at all. In fact, um, you could argue I didn't have much English, <laughs> and, and you can you can even see it in the lyrics, in the pronunciation of 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 the words in the in the songs, like in the recordings, and even even like the uh, resound the horn. That's like grammatically <laughs> incorrect. <laughs> it was a play on. Sounding the horn, but because it was the second album, it was re-sounding, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but because it was so, it was it was very wrong. It was ne- it never came across that way. <laughs> I never thought twice about that title. Me ever. neither, dude. You I just said it. that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, because you get you you like a sound resounds, but you cannot resound anything. You know, true. Right? Yeah, <laughs> so works. Uh, so then after that, I, I, I started reading in English. Um, so there's the stuff I read before and it's the, the stuff I read after. And there's fortunately a few things uh, like Tolkien, Moorcock and all of the major movies I managed to double. So, um, yeah, I knew them in, in Italian, but I read them again. In English, because obviously the original, whatever the language is always, if you can read the original in its original language, it's definitely the superior version. Mm. Um, so, did, yeah, that's it. Just curious on the same, while we're on that subject, did you ever notice any differences in any, uh, anything that got lost in translation from Italian to English when you read them in the other languages? So I'd be hard pressed to n- name examples, like specific examples, right. but. Yeah, plenty. Lots lost in translation. Or maybe approximated rather than bigger because that 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 was the best thing you could do, you know. Right. Uh, like I mean, I read uh, an English translation of the Divine Comedy. Mm. Nah. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> no point. <laughs> Just curious, also, uh, Howie and Jason, uh, Howie, was it always Cauldron Born? You know, Joe said he was, um, Doom Sword was a, a Stormbringer. Was it always Eternal Champion with you, Jason? Yeah, it was always Eternal from like it, the band name came first, actually, I think. So mm. it was just, it, it, and it, it, I knew right away that we weren't going to be writing songs about, uh, oh, it wasn't going to be it just about Michael Moorcock uh, stories. It was just, we chose Eternal Champion just because it's a, kind of an all encompassing, kind of uh like a name that readers of the genre will, will know you know what i mean it's kind of like as, as joe said it's important to have an epic even when it comes to your name it should kind of evoke an epic feeling and so eternal champion does that and it's just kind of a you know it's, it's just got it's a cool concept 
also, as Joe just said about the law and chaos, such an engaging, uh, it's so much uh, more relatable than good and evil. It's been done to death, and we've all seen it in so many forms. It's such an archetype that the law and chaos is such a trope breaker, and Elric is such a trope breaker, and he's so much more relatable than Conan. You know, I mean, reading the Conan stories for the first time was, you know, insane. It's really visceral, visceral experience reading them, but it's not like you really feel like... Uh, your Conan, unless you're like, I don't know, like a wrestler or a, you know, or like a combat veteran, you know what I mean? Yeah. Something like that. But right when you read Elric, you're like, okay, not every protagonist in these stories is like Conan. And every person that tries to write it, just a Conan type character fails, you know, you just, we already have it, you know what I mean? You yeah. have to think of something new. So that, you know, that was why we chose Eternal Champion because uh, it's just a, uh, it's just a cool name and a, and a cool concept by Michael Moorcock. So, what about you? How was it always Cauldron Born for you? Yeah, I I read this book, The Black Cauldron. I guess I was 10, 11, maybe even 12 years old, something like that. It was fifth or sixth grade, something like that, around that time in the 70s. And um, the I thought the book was pretty lame. I was reading better comic books. <laughs> and by then, I'd moved on to Doc Savage paperbacks, and, and even those were better than that book. But there was one thing I really liked about it. And I think I, I read it for some kind of a, it was not like a competition, but this academic program where you get some kind of a, a ribbon or something. If you read these books, I just did it for the hell of it. I think I got extra points on my grade or something for doing that. And um, so I read this book, The Black Cauldron. And the only thing I liked about that book was the, the Cauldron Moor. And the Cauldron Moor are these dead warriors they put in the cauldron. And this is based on, Welsh myth, I guess. And they put these dead warriors in this cauldron and cast this spell and they come back to life as these, um, you know, undead warriors. And um, and the cauldron born are like these demonic things. And um, so that really left an impression on I me, mean, the concept of cauldron born and that name just really stuck with me when I was a kid. I'm like, I'm going to use that for something one day. I don't know what. And I was, I've just gotten into music around that time. It's like, nah, I couldn't use it for anything to do with music but i'm gonna use it for something and then later on when i got this idea you know the, the whole sword and sorcery metal thing was coming along i'm like i'm gonna i'm gonna form a band and i'm gonna call it calder more and uh and some guys even made fun of the name they're like yeah calder more and skillet born or whatever and i'm like no man you're, you're not you're messing up <laughs> you don't know what's going on here so yeah it was it was always called or born with me it's a great name, but it's one of the best. <laughs> I love it. I love it. With I didn't know the how it works with the, with the, you know, the C with the hand and everything. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. I always thought it was to do with like um, witchcraft, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a real kind of uh, witchcraft aura to it. I love. So it looks like the album cover with the. You know the rising out of the cult. Yeah, the cult yeah, and, it's, it's, it blends in perfectly. Yeah, I know. Yeah, actually, I, I know. Uh, I'm gonna feel free to digress a lot because I have a very fond memory of Cauldron Born. So after um, we we did this demo in three days, um, we reached an agreement with Underground Symphony, and we went to visit their offices, and the guy had just moved from his old place to the new one and um, didn't really have furniture. Lots of uh, boxes of CDs everywhere. He had a desk and a chair for himself, but not for anyone because he didn't receive that many guests, um, Maurizio. Uh, um, so he he said, um, uh, sit down and looked around. I mean, no chairs, so pulled some uh, boxes of CDs and vinyls. And then, you know, in his kind of pitch to um, try and convince us to sign for Underground Symphony, which he didn't need to do, but I, I was already fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, he was showing me how well he was working with um, with bands and she made, uh, gave me the Cauldron Born, Born of the Cauldron CD. Um, because that, that that's 1997, is it not? That's uh, 1997, yeah. And you guys released um your debut album, I think, a year later, didn't you? Yeah, right after that, it was right after that, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah recorded in 98, 
maybe very, very early 99 came out. Uh, something like that, yeah. So actually, that would make it 25 years old in, <laughs> in, a, little, cool. in a little while. <laughs> uh, that's it. I remember Maurizio telling me about Doom Soul. Um, I was talking about doing another album, and I asked him how how the reception was to this kind of heavy metal. Because when we did that album, we were almost too proggy for traditional metal fans, and we we're too traditional for prog metal fans. You know, the people who listen to Dream Theater and stuff like that. And of course, on uh, Underground Symphony, I think the only two bands that were doing this kind of metal was Calder Born and Doom Sword. And he he mentioned Doom Sword. He's like, well, we'll see when the new Doom Sword album comes out. Um, you know how things are, and uh, so he, he he was very confident in in that release. But uh, yeah, we were the only two, and the rest of the the it was mostly Italian bands. I think there was maybe one other American band that I could remember on Underground Symphony at the time, and that was Jack Frost Band. I think it was called Frostbite, and that wasn't any kind of metal. It was just some kind of hard rock kind of stuff. But um, and all the other Italian bands were playing the symphonic power, prog power kind of stuff on the label. So we had like the only two bands, Doom Sword and Calder Born, that were this kind of a true metal bands on the label. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Just to ask you guys, we've been talking about sword and sorcery, obviously, but where where's the line in the sand that must be drawn at some point in the story where we have sword and sorcery on one side and fantasy on the other. What's the, what's the distinction to you guys? Well, one of the things with sword and sorcery, I think is it's, it's a bit darker. The protagonists tend to be a bit morally ambiguous and self-serving. Uh, everyone from Conan to uh, Elric to uh, Carl Edward Wagner's Kane, not to be confused with Solomon Kane by Robert E. Howard. But these these characters are are more morally ambiguous and they tend to act more on their own. Whereas in in the Tolkien esque pot, which is high fantasy Tolkien esque branch of heroic fiction, you have more of this this group kind of thing going. It's almost like a a D and D game, and where these group of people are working together, and it's it tends to be for a cause they're they're driven by some sort of cause it's almost like it it's their destiny they were destined to do this or it was fate that they they were chosen to um come up against whatever is uh considered evil or wicked and to bring it down whereas a character like conan or cain they um are doing things that benefit them. They just happen to be on the right side of the argument in the situations they find themselves. In. I th- think that's right on. Yeah. I mean, that, that was really, <laughs> yeah. How he, how he just nodded out, out the park for everybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I think he's right. I mean, the sword and sorcery also team uh, tends to be a short story format, which I think is kind of important for the genre because it's good for short for sword and sorcery to kind of pull you in and keep you there and read the whole thing in one. So you kind of stay in it, you know, cause that's kind of the point of these stories is to be a little bit more fast paced than a 300 page fantasy novel. It is more interesting. I think to have these morally ambiguous self-serving characters, you know, and how he's right about that again, it's a, uh, it's usually about one or two, like a, you know, like a Fawford and gray Mauser type situation or a, you know, Nifteline is always, with a a companion so you know it it can kind of break those uh barriers a little bit you don't know if it's fantasy or sword and sorcery i think there's some books like that we might discuss one later but that that was right on from how he got i don't have much to add other than yeah it probably usually contains some horror elements sword and sorcery almost always seems to have a horror element and it's really hard to tell if it's even fantasy or horror. That's well, that's my favorite kind of thing. I really like when the horror is so strong that you know it's it's not really clear what genre it is. You know, Joe. Uh, right before you go, you said you started with uh, Token. So how was it? You know, from going from high fantasy to sword and sorcery, did you notice the distinction? Very much. Yeah. In fact, my answer was going to be that 
um, well, I mean, echoing Jason, I think uh, how his answer was right on. But um, in my head, because I, I see things a little bit in, in in sets, so if you got like the whole fantasy genre is big one big set of <clears throat> uh, literature, um, um, then you've got uh, fa within fantasy you got generally speaking high fantasy and low fantasy, and I definitely think that sword and sorcery would be a subset of low fantasy. So I uh, don't think it, it, you can call anything that has a, a spell every two seconds, uh, sword and sorcery. It, there has to be, uh, there has to be a darker element, but also the the sorcery needs to be sorcery. So sometimes, you know, whoever performs it would be like the one character in the story that that does that. It's not like every every you know blasting fireballs at each other. Right. That's not sword and sorcery. Um, so that that's more or less the only addition I would have is that to me, sword and sorcery is also if it, if it's high fantasy, then there's no chance it can be sword and sorcery. <laughs> uh, and yeah, in the horror elements, definitely. I mean, uh, I, we we're uh, recording the new album and we've done a three part song on um, on the Scarlet Citadel by yeah. uh, Howard, um, and I would. You know, if you read the whole thing, um, the the whole thing wouldn't even be sword and sorcerer. Yeah, it is, but really, the sorcerer when when uh, when he's chained down uh, in the, in the dungeon and has to escape and meets all these kind of horrors and saves a a sorcerer. That that's real sword and sorcery. Right mm -hmm. to echo what Jason was talking about. That's that's the core of sword and sorcery for me. Then when Conan breaks out and goes to uh, save, um, you know, Shamar with open pitch battle and all that, that it's just epic. It's not sword and sorcery per se. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. Right. You just broke the interview, Joe. Dropping uh record a new doom sword album that's all we're going to do <laughs> <laughs> i just got so excited <laughs> you know before yeah. the, before i move on from there just the uh i i make a own distinction my own distinction between magic and sorcery you know like you said joe magic is you know everyone has it everyone has fireballs or you know there's there's a race that knows magic but i view sorcery as it's heavily in there's there's stakes you know there's going to be consequences there's great uh, loss that must be had to use this you know there's that's that's how i make that distinction there yeah you know, it's always like an unpredictable force that turns on the user usually or it's usually hated by the protagonist like conan hates it because yeah. there's no controlling that you know what i mean there's just it's unpredictable and so he would hate that you know what i mean so right makes sense right and, you know, just uh, speaking of generalities, you know, there's a lot of varied material out there, but it seems, you know, more often than not, the the sword aspect seems to be up front with a, you know, barbarian leaning protagonist trying to vanquish the sorcerer. But, you know, how do you all feel about the shoe being on the other foot, you know, maybe with a, a more magical leaning character having the sorcery at the forefront? You know, and can you think of any examples of that? I like um, Carl Edward Wagner's Kane story. And of course, he is a swordsman, but he's also a sorcerer. I guess some readers think of this character as a villain. He's the villain as the protagonist of the story, Cain. And uh, so I like the characters who use both. Um, I can't think. I mean, I like some of the the villains, the um, villains like in Howard stuff. I mean, the the sorcerers is what I'm talking about. They're villains. But as far as a you know a benevolent sorcerer or a sorcerer who's working on the side of what we would I guess perceive as good, the only one I can think of would be um, from the Solomon Kane stories would be in Longa, mm. you know, the old black African juju uh, wizard who, who's also learned white man magic when he was a slave. He's the only one I can think of that would be uh, using sorcery for good but i've always leaned toward these characters like um kane and, and elric to a degree elric he 
he uses sorcery and, and drugs just to stay alive. Yeah. And he's from a race, the Melnabonians uh, practice magic. And then he comes into possession of this magic sword that gives him strength. So, you know, you've got the sword and the magic there. But um, that that's what I lean to. Yeah, I got to agree with Howie with the cane. I mean, he's, I think Carl Edward Wagner makes it either into my top three or top five writers of the, of the genre. And so uh, even though Kane is such a bad guy, you know what I mean? You can't, you're still kind of rooting for him. You know yeah, what I mean? That's, it's very yeah. interesting. He's got a charm. But about it puts him. you in a weird position as a reader. You know what I mean? So, and Kane does use uh sorcery for his own ends. Always. You know, he's just so self-concerned always. And then he's always plotting <laughs> with people. He's such a, He's so cunning, you know. I mean, he's always there's always like tears to the plot and, and revelations in the end, and you know, Kane just uses anything he can. What he's he's very pragmatic, you mm-hmm. know, in, in his uh in his use of it. So, but it, you know, it comes back to bite him, you know what I mean? In, in most most times, and so and Elric's a, a good pull too. I mean, he uses sorcery just to stay alive to be strong kind of differently than kane he's not using it uh to build an empire elric isn't even interested in empire building it you know in the beginning wants to shirk off his empire you know what i mean and and his his sorts of sorcery element is uh more medicinal you know what i mean right i guess then then it comes later he uses sorcery in all kinds of ways but uh yeah those are two really good uses of of the sorcery and in the in you know the genre well actually uh no I, i'm not going to deviate for me elric uh and i was specifically thinking of when he invokes Ariok. that that's proper sorcery you know? yeah so forget spells and everything invoking a lord of chaos sorcery yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dictionary definition um so yeah yeah uh, i'm going i'm going to stick with the gentleman's answer and adding that you know we're all writers here do you guys have uh specific stories that you go to when you're looking for a kick in the ass creative wise not really i read a lot of nonfiction too um history and like about historical battles and stuff like that i've been reading off and on a book called the vandals about um Genseric or um Geyseric, um which was the um Oh, the, the leader of a Germanic tribe that um, one of them that brought down Rome in its final days. But um, so I read some of that stuff. There's nothing I really read to. I reread some stuff every now and then, um, but there's nothing I really go back to, to for any kind of inspiration for something I'm right. Well, I really like uh kind of outliers in the genre. I really like Michael Shea. You know, he's such a weird writer. You really have to pay attention to his stories as you're reading him. His, his prose is kind of stilted and it can be hard to follow, but he's a really good writer. I, I admire, I love uh, Fritz Leiber, Carl Edward Wagner again. He's just a big inspiration, I think Wagner is to me. I like going back and reading Lovecraft and finding that magic again when I first read it and trying to get that feeling again. That's really inspiring, so. Lovecraft's one is just like an old standard that uh that inspires me. But and also lately I've been reading a lot of uh like Splatterpunk, uh David Show, and um I've been reading uh Wraith of the Broken Land by S. Craig Zoller, mm. uh, which is really gritty uh Western. I don't know what to compare it to, like maybe Blood Meridian or something like that, you know. It's so that stuff does inspire me too, you know what I mean? For like the uh, the fighting element, you know what I mean? I, I kind of look to Shea as an inspiration for uh, world building. His environments are so strange and alien, you know what I mean? They're so interesting to read about. And, and Lovecraft has all the atmosphere I want and the cosmicism I like, right? Uh, Carl Edward Wagner brought in the kind of amoral character that you know is kind of interesting, which I like. So, yeah, those are some of them. I'm totally with you on the Lovecraft. The more you inch away from Lovecraft and then you come back to him, you realize just how much he stands out from his peers just in terms of mood. Yeah, absolutely. What about you, Joe? What do you go to to get the spark going? So I think if I uh, have to give a, an answer at any moment in my life, you say, what what you go back to, that would be Howard. 
but um, not Conan though. Um, I think um, uh, the Bram McMorn and the Call stories are the ones that really, uh, I don't know, they, they have something more in them. I don't know why, maybe the character, I don't know. Just to give a, a slightly different spin, I'm a very oral and also a visual person. So um, for me, illustrations, paintings uh, are actually what get me going with uh, for inspiration. That's why I'm surrounded by them. I can't see, but I can see the bottom of the deck dealer there. Yeah. Um, um, and also, uh, this this is a bit unusual. There's this uh, YouTube channel called the Cyberarian. No, I don't know now if I'm allowed to <laughs> drop the names, yeah, but sure. the Scottish guy that does uh, narrations of um, well, for for the majority, it's Howard stuff, and his interpretation is out of this world. Like really, um, I if you, if you were to pick one story just to get an idea, I would say either Del Cardas Cat or uh, Night of the Kings. Uh, one is a call story, the other is uh, uh, Bram McMorn. Bram okay. McMorn actually wig call in it because he comes yeah. into the future from. Uh, and if you listen to, to those stories, all the accents this guy pulls off, the atmosphere he injects in the story. I don't know, maybe because it's coming into my ears rather yeah. than through my eyes. Uh, music is for the ears, so maybe I should come in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, but yeah, that, that that would be it. Looking at paintings, I have got a lot of uh, books of uh, illustrators, not just Prozetta, even though he'd be my main influence. But uh, yeah, that that that's basically it. Here's a question I got for all you guys. What would you say is the uh, the most rare physical copy of a book that you own? Oh, um, that's hard to say. Probably, I don't know about rare, but they certainly go for a pretty penny. Would be I, I have a number of of collections of, of books like that, but probably my most expensive collection would be the Centipede editions of the yeah you know what i'm gonna say the i knew you're gonna say that. <laughs> the um that would probably be that and then i've got those death dealer paperbacks i've got all four of those and those those are exorbitant um <laughs> and um i've got carl edward wagner's uh exorcisms of ecstasies um so quite a quite a few i mean i could i've got every flat surface in my house is covered in books <laughs> As and be. um so yeah, I've, I've got a ton of stuff like that. Those uh Wagner uh, centipede press uh, things you were talking about, I don't think they go less for than four figures now. No, right well, well, or three at least. Yeah, yeah. Uh, high three. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's some of those that you see that I think I saw some that was like eighteen hundred two grand or something like the other day for the whole set. Jeez. They were oh, signed wow. by the artists. Oh too. yeah, I saw so, that too, Howie. Yeah, I saw that. But I mean, even even the ones that aren't signed are um, just astronomical. Yeah. What about you, Jason? What you got in the uh, dungeon? I wish I had it behind me. I have a, a Carl Edward Wagner. It's it's called an author's choice. Uh, it's a hardcover, small hardcover, with just Carl Edward Wagner stories, and it's got River of Nights Dreaming. Uh, maybe at first just ghostly trying to remember what's in it but it's signed by carl Edward wagner so i like that i have his signature a lot wow i found it in a bookstore in seattle at the last time eternal champion played there last year we were just went to this bookstore before the gig and i saw the book i didn't know what it was i'd never seen it before it's author it says author's choice on the cover it's got a, a sketch drawing of carl on the front and I saw that and I grabbed it. I was like, holy shit. And I looked at it. It said $75. And I was like, oh, I'm buying this. And I looked and it had that autograph in there. I was like, holy shit, $75. This has got to be like hundreds of dollars. Bond. And it just became like a treasure immediately. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen that? You guys, have you seen that? The Office Choice hardcover I'm talking no, about? No, I haven't seen it. I might slip out and go get it and come back in sure. just to show it to you. Because I've never seen another one 
Yeah. And I, I've got a few Arkham House first editions that I, you know, that I treasure. That's those are probably the rarest things I have. Joe, you got anything on the shelf back there? Well, uh, okay, N- nothing award, but uh, as in that would be actually worth money. But if I were to choose, what, what I feel is the most precious is this um, version of the Vanishing Tower that has been uh, illustrated by Michael Whelan. And because um, obviously there's also the illustration side of it, right? Michael <laughs> Whelan. Right. Um, and there's uh, these drawings in it that I've never seen anywhere in a, like, they're just amazing. Wow. Um, uh, I'll show you another couple because they're out of this world. They're all um, Waylon? Yeah. All the, the, the whole book is illustrated by, uh, it's like having a, a uh, huge series of Siritongo covers. In the, yeah. The book. <laughs> uh, this one's unreal. Oh, wow. That's Corum, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So, yeah, nothing that would be actually worth amazing money, but certainly uh, dear to my heart. Awesome, man. So we kind of touched on this already, but something I definitely wanted to touch on was uh, underrated, you know, sword and sorcery gems, novels, short stories, whatever, you know, maybe more unknown, uh, obscure writers or unknown stories from popular writers. What do you guys have in that regard? Well, um, you know, so people either love or hate, them, but I mentioned just a minute ago those Death Dealer novels by James Silk. And uh, they do get progressively weaker as they go. And and like I said, there are four of them. They're much better than the Glenn Danzig comics. You know, as try as I might, I could not like those comics because the artwork was great in the Glenn Danzig comics. I I guess it's Verotica or or something like that. And uh, they look great, but there was little to no script or story there to them. Um, kind of like you know his his first horror movie. I haven't seen anything he's done after that. But you know, I'm always rooting for that guy, but it just always doesn't <laughs> work for me. <laughs> but uh, anyway, back to those novels. James Silk. It says on the cover by James Silk or Frank Frazetta. Of course, Frank Frazetta didn't do any of the writing. He created that new character, and it was around all this time, and people were wondering what the hell is that because the the other like the um, the Kane books. You know, you had some Frazetta art used on that and you go oh, that's Kane when you see it or you know that's Conan but then you see these death you're like, what is what is this guy so James Silk wrote these novels and the first couple of them I think are really good so, like I said people either love them or hate them so that that's some obscure stuff um another obscure gem that I would recommend that readers pick up is um the Sorcerer's Shadow by David C. Smith it's one of my favorite um sword and sorcery novels of all time and um and then, of course, you know, there's um, Ramsey Campbell's uh, Ryer or Ryer Ray, however you say the character's name. But the, that was published by DMR in Far Away and Never, the whole collection. And that that is the best collection to get. I mean, it's been published before that, but it has uh, all of Ramsey Campbell's sword and sorcery, other than things he'd finish like fragments for Robert E. Howard or, uh, you know, whatever, just yeah. they, or he had collaborated with other writers. But uh, that that's a really good obscure sword and sorcery novel from somebody who, not novel but collection, from um, somebody. And, you know, I've said too. You've got to be, and you guys were mentioning horror, and I've totally neglected this in the conversation. But I believe you, a, a writer needs to be very good at writing horror to be good at writing sword and sorcery. And Ramsey Campbell is a master of horror. And when you asked that question earlier, I was kind of like a deer in the headlights. I didn't know. I didn't expect that to say, what What do you read? What's your go-to to sort of inspire you? What I'm reading more than anything as far as fiction, I should have said said this, was I read, uh, I mostly read horror. Man. Mm-hmm. I, I read horror far more than I do sword and sorcery. And my two main horror writers are Thomas Ligotti and Ramsey Campbell, uh, especially Ramsey Campbell's short fiction. Some of the novels, you know, I'm kind of lukewarm on, but I really like his, his short fiction, particularly his old short fiction. But uh, anyway, long answer. I'll let somebody else talk. <laughs> <laughs> I got to be in the right mood for Legati, man. 
<laughs> yeah. You got to block out a whole month for the yeah. guy. You got yeah. to clear, you gotta clear your calendar. <laughs> You're in for a depressive episode. Yeah. That. Yeah. Um, well, me and how and we're all of the same mind here, I think, a lot because every time Howie says something like that, it's it, you know, because I was just going to say David C. Smith. I do love The Sorcerer's Shadow. That's a great book. Um, I also love his character, Oron. Uh, mm. Oron's great. Um, those books are awesome. If you want kind of a, uh, someone who's kind of like in between a Conan and a Kane, would you say that, Howie? Would you agree with that as a Oron? I mean, yeah, it's kind of a, he's a dark figure, kind of like a dark that. figure. Yeah. 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 The Bull Man. I would recommend David C. Smith for that. Um, before I mention Michael Shea, but I really tell people to, to search out the Nift, the Lean uh, book. And the uh, a book he wrote called In Yana, The Touch of and Dying. It's they're so weird. I mean, they're like the weirdest sword and sorcery I've probably ever read. It, it maybe the only comparison would be like Jack Vance or um maybe Gene Wolfe or something like that, mm. because it's very weird. Um, but once you get to the end, the payoff is so good and the characters are uh, really bad there's so many there's so much uh gruesome depictions of things the there's so many um like florid uh vivid descriptions of gruesome things you know what i mean it's uh it's just something you don't always get so i would recommend michael shea for that and, and like how he said thomas legati he has a really great story i think it's his only real i mean you could call it sword and sorcery but um it's probably philosophical horror in the guise of that. It, it's called Masquerade of a Dead Sword. That's a that's mm -hmm. a great story. I recommend people go read. You know, I don't hate to forget something. Every time I do one of these, I forget <laughs> someone. Maybe if I do Clark Ashton Smith is a good one. I mean, he's pretty popular and people know about him, but I don't know how much people really read him anymore. So right. I would say that too. Oh, in the Ramsey Campbell, I gotta say, people should really get that uh collection of Ryer stories. They're really good. I think you do need to write horror to be a good sword and sorcery writer. And Ramsey Campbell's one of the top guys that we're actually, <laughs> I don't even know if I should say this because people, we're trying to write a song about changer of names. So that'll probably be like uh, somewhere soon. I really I'm love that story. Man. Yeah. I'm not here to get as knowledgeable out of the other two gentlemen. But um, so I'm hoping that when I say, uh, oh, this, this is, the book I thought was lesser known, but they're not gonna go, and that's complete mainstream. <laughs> but um, one of the one of the novels I really enjoyed, and it's very early uh, fantasy. It's uh, Eric Bright Eyes by H. Ryder Haggard, and um, I don't know. I I classify that as sword and sorcery, or to, at least to an extent. Um, and it's got this great quality that uh, Broken Sword uh, picked up later on of kind of pastation, uh, Viking Age uh, um, tales with kind of a bit of magic thrown into it. And it's 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 kind of dark. Um, there's romance into it also that comes with the context of the years when it was written in i think that you know romance was a big thing in in those days but um yeah eric bright eyes would be one of the the books that when i say hey have you read eric bright eyes everybody's like no i have um, not read that one i haven't either but i did buy it on your recommendation joe so i still have it on my reading pile. cheers <laughs> <laughs> most of my it's, recent readings have come from all you guys you know howie uh richard tierney and joe was the reason i read the broken sword and why i had a probably like a depressive episode for a week after reading it <laughs> uh, look there's a there's a thing right epic is a big word right mm. and i think that for me uh epic has a, a kind of a tragic quality and the broken sword and Eric Bright Eyes just do a massive job of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know what to expect. You now. want to be in a good mood when you're <laughs> noted. <laughs> you're not going to be after. Uh... 
So uh, did either of you guys, uh, Jason and Joe, did you guys have a chance or time to read the Richard Tierney, any of Simon Gita stories? Yeah, you know, I said that I hadn't written, I hadn't read a Simon Gita story, but I realized I did. I read uh, The Ring of Set before because it's in Swords Against Darkness, number one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just forgot about it. Once I went back, I was like, oh, yeah, I read this story, of course. It's a great story. That's the only one I've read is The Ring of Set, but it, it is really great. I have a lot of questions about, where the character goes I, I know that he there was a lot of collaborations i think uh robert price wrote a story yeah right yeah. with him it's in the, uh, it's in that collection and it bought right and he kind of wove in like a gnosticism to the all the, all the other mythos that's involved in the historical fiction i generally like the historical fiction angle you know what i mean like the simon of gita is kind of a lot like uh like brand mcmorn you know what i mean yeah. like the historical fiction of the picks it's just kind of ripe for that uh, injection of horror, you know, and the fact that it's kind of a Lovecraftian mythos horror is perfect yep. for us because we're just going to read it as fans anyway. The, uh, Simon was kind of, to me, he's kind of similar to Cain in that he's a biblical reference, you know what I mean? Because so Carl Edward Wagner's Cain is, is based off the bi biblical character of Cain. And, and so is Simon of Gita is Simon Magus, right? Yep. In the Bible. Right. So right. there's that really interesting element. But I think a lot of this stuff that is like um, historical fiction that might interweave Lovecraftian mythos or a horror element is it doesn't have like the oppressive uh, cosmicism, you know what I mean, of uh, the source material of Lovecraft, you know what I mean? Like Lovecraft would look at the little dealings of these cultures as just moments in an uncaring universe you know what i mean yeah yeah so i guess there's that there's that there's that it's almost like writers as fans of lovecraft writing fan fiction you know with their own characters and using history as the backdrop and then interjecting the lovecraft as kind of um fans or to have that or element because it doesn't get any better than that to have something eldritch and or you know so old right. just the fact that things are so old is kind of where the horror comes from so uh i really enjoy that story i gotta read the rest of them for sure yeah uh you'll love them and just before we get too far into richard howie you knew richard personally uh for people who may not be familiar why don't you just tell us a bit about richard's work and how you uh, came to know him um well richard <laughs> How I came to know him, I'm trying to think, um, I had come into contact with somebody. At, at one time, you know, back in the 90s, when I really got in, early 90s, when I really got into all this sword and sorcery stuff, I I met a lot of people that were sort of musical idols to me. And that really held no, I really had little interest in that anymore. But I got so much into reading these old sword and sorcery books, I was like, I was just fascinated by these people who wrote and I wanted to reach out to some of them and, and I had contacted a, a handful of guys and I managed to get an email for Richard and got in touch with him. And surprisingly he was very cordial and um, um, we started a correspondence and, uh, and I'd read, I'd first discovered Richard's writing in um, Jason mentioned uh, swords against darkness. And matter of fact, I have those right here. That hmm. uh, can you see the whole book? Do yeah. I need to hold it up further? Okay, so this is Swords of Darkness, Volume One, which was published in 1977, and it had the uh, Ring of Set was the first um, Simon of Gita story, and then these are all Simon of Gita stories I'm referring to, and then in Volume Two it was also in 1977 was um, the Scroll of Toth, mm -hmm. and and then 1978 was Volume Three that had um, the sort of Spartacus in it, which I hijacked for a Calder Born song and made it about my own thing. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, involving the Calder Born um, mascot, <laughs> Thorn. Right. But uh, anyway, so I started this conversation. I'd read a bunch of his stuff already, and, and I guess he maybe thought he was kind of forgotten or whatever, and he was glad to have somebody who was interested in what he was doing because, to me, he was like a just an iconic figure. And uh, so we started this correspondence and we talked for a while and we talked right up to his death. He died in, uh, I think, 2022. He was born in um, 
1936. He was born the year Robert E. Howard died. And I think um, Andrew Offit, Andrew J. Offit, who uh, was a renowned science fiction and fantasy writer, he edited these um, Swords Against Darkness books. And he even may, uh, speculated that, you know, maybe jokingly, that uh, Richard was Robert E. Howard in, incarnate, <laughs> or reincarnated, rather. Because he uh, he died the year, uh, or he was born the year Howard committed suicide right. and died. So anyway, Richard once told me he had more in common with Robert E. Howard than any other writer that he felt that he did. Um, so, but he was also really into um, the history of early Christianity, history of um, ancient Rome. Um, just, just would take years and years of reading to get to the point he was at to be able to, to implement the kind of detail in the stories that he did in mm -hmm. those Simon of Geta stories, as far as Imperial Rome. So there was, uh, he, like I said, he was interested in early Christianity, the history of early Christianity. He had given talks. I know at least one when I was still uh, talking to him right before he died in 2022. He um, had given a a lecture at a church a while back um, on the history, early history of Christianity. And he was also interested in Gnosticism and Gnosticism basically in a nutshell, at least as it applies to what we, we read is, okay, so the world is created by an evil God. And um, that's, and as it applies to somebody like the fiction of HP Lovecraft or even more pronounced in Thomas Ligotti's work, you have the macrocosm, which is whatever your concept of the source of creation is, beating down on the microcosm, which is man. And that's um, cosmic horror. And I use this word again in a nutshell, is that um, you have the macrocosm terrorizing the microcosm. And so that's kind of where the Gnostic thing comes in. Um really to, to get by it deep into the Gnostic um, background of Richard's works, I would recommend talking to um, Robert M. Price. Have you, have you talked with him about, I haven't, Prince? I haven't talked with him yet, but I'm going to reach yeah, out he would to be him. a good guest to have on here. He also is publishing. Um, he was the heir to Lynn Carter's estate and he's publishing flashing swords uh, again, which is Lynn Carter's fantasy anthology from, you know, way back in seven. I read uh, Swords Against Caesar. So that would be gotcha. the, yeah, the origin of the character, I suppose. So first of all, I loved it. Um, and it, it invoked a number of weird feelings. Um, because for a start, how, how am I going to put it? If you read, uh, if Howie read a, story by Moorcock that said um, and Elric through Stormbringer and said to the people of Atlanta, Georgia and you'd be like, what? Um, because <laughs> <laughs> because all of the places are <laughs> yeah are actually, I don't, my, my father was or uh, so you know flicking a sword and sorcery novel but also with familiar places in it was uh, very, very strange. Never felt that. So <laughs> it was a first. <laughs> um, secondly, um, I also felt a bit stupid because I started writing my own novel. Um, I'm not a writer, despite you saying, you know, writing and being a writer, different things. Um, I tried. <clears throat> and um, uh, so the main character would be this uh, uh, early Middle Ages monk that performs a like a reverse uh conversion so he goes from being christian to a pagan um because of let's call it divine intervention um awesome. like the opposite of of jesus he's a christian but odin kind of makes it clear you're odin incarnate so off you go and destroy the whole Christian uh, <laughs> reality. Um, and the reason why I felt stupid is there were so many commonalities with 
uh, with Simon, uh, you know, that kind of focus hatred on something in particular for him. It was Rome um, and the uh, the setting. So all these kind of Latin names and uh, uh, Roman culture popping up because early Middle Ages really at the time of uh, Germanic invasions, um, the, the main culture is still, uh, still Roman with a heavy Byzantine uh, footprint. Uh, yeah, so aside from, from these, which are just my own personal uh, um, um, impression uh, or, or rather feelings that the, feelings that the novel has stirred, I, I just, uh, I just loved it. I loved the, I love the restrained use of of sorcery, how it was like used uh, uh, here and there, but when it was used, it just punched you in the face. I, I mean, one of the first, one of very early scenes when um, uh, Simon's in the arena and uh, with the sword of Spartacus, mm -hmm. somehow, you know, killing... Uh, Killing causes the Etruscan demon to come yeah. down from the sky and blast fifty thousand people, um, and then leave the whole scene. Uh, you know uh, the, the the massacre. Uh, it was uh, it was unexpected and very. Uh, uh, you know, it felt like watching a movie, but a really well done one and. Mm. Uh, uh, but yeah, I, I like I, I I will summarize it like this after this rambling. It was very classy. I like when you've got something as powerful as magic, but you use it uh, with with a drip. And when you knew you use it, you do it really well. So yeah, it was very much appreciated, and I will be finishing uh, the whole Simon Gera uh, corpus. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Because one of the things that stood out to me reading it uh just richard's historical prowess and you being italian it probably even stands out even more so to you actually you know living in the region and knowing personally the locations that he's speaking of is, is it was it hard for you to believe that that was written by an american <laughs> uh yes yes and no uh no when it comes to uh to some of the names which were made up but almost purposely off line yeah. you know no no person would have that name um but then when it came to the depth with which he described um society you know the whatever goes on every day and uh, uh the routines the even like life as a gladiator it was very realistic. It wasn't done in a in a cheesy way or anything. It was very accurate. There was definitely profound research behind that. You could really smell it, you know? Mm. Like the way, being Italian, I'm obsessed with food. Um, the, the one thing that permanently features in my novel is a uh, description of the food. So... Not wanting to make it up, I went and retrieved the, the Dere Culinaria, which is the first ever recipe book that's been transcribed and is like uh, coming from imperial times. And so I could stick to exactly what people were eating and how they were cooking it. Mm. Um, and uh, I, I 100%, that's one of the things Richard Tierney did. Uh, as well as everything else that went on. So familiarizing with everyday life, you know. Um, it, it's, uh, it's such a commitment to want to go and know everything that there is to know about a society before starting to write about it. Yeah. I don't know how much time went into researching um, those days before he, he published the novel, but it was amazing. So yeah, yeah. Now, just speaking on the biblical references, uh, Jason mentioned uh, Cain being a reference to the biblical Cain. I don't know if you re read this story, Joe. Not not to have all these spoilers out here, but we're talking about it. 
uh, in the story, the blade of the slayer, the Simon of Gitta story, that that's uh, another b- biblical reference he puts in there to Cain because that's Cain's blade that he uses in the story. There you go. Oh, wow. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to get this whole collection and read them. Yeah, for sure. Oh, oh yeah. Well, I, I will say this though, as if, and, I'm, and maybe I'm wrong, and you know, just look. If it goes well, great. If it doesn't, <laughs> good. <laughs> edit. That's the magic of editing. <laughs> <Is> the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What were you doing? Were you on a podcast? No, no, I was. <laughs> um, uh, the ring is set. Surely that's the Phoenix on the sword. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, same uh, the the story directly after that. I had it written down. It may have been. Uh... Yeah, it was the Ring of Set and both of the uh, the one directly after that. I don't have the name, but both of them were Phoenix on the sword. Uh... Oh, the scroll of thought. Both uh, because yeah. thought is on the, the Kepri one too. The Soul of Kepri, I think it was. Yeah, that was another one. The Ring of Set. I remember the Phoenix on the, on the sword another spoiler because that's another we've done mm-hmm. two uh conan stories in the new album uh the other is the phoenix on the sword oh, and, oh uh, awesome there you go and that's you know cool. the sorcerer notices that the fat can a noble guy takes out the ring and is shaped as a serpent he loses his, his mind <laughs> and stabs him on the spot um and and regains his powers right Right. You mentioned um, the uh, boy of the Slayer or the Cain the Cain story that Richard wrote. Yeah. Um, Carl Edward Wagner did not want him using his character in that story. He had even discussed that with him. So I guess oh. Richard just changed the spelling of the name and went ahead and did it anyway. So it was supposed to be Carl's Cain then. Oh yeah, that was that was Carl's Cain. Yeah, oh wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Early fan art. <laughs> <laughs> so i wanted to uh i know we just uh touched on this a few minutes ago but uh these are a mutual friend of ours me uh john zaremba he's also a writer me and him kind of share similar thoughts on the broken sword and i understand that you know it's a norse tragedy i love the storytelling beautifully written and all that stuff but you know the theme just makes me feel icky it does it doesn't sit well with me just thinking you know there's nothing that you can do to change how this goes so i like i said after i read it i just felt kind of icky and you know i probably will never read this again so <laughs> how, do you, how do you guys feel uh personally just about the theme of destiny specifically in that fashion you're talking about the incest oh, well that's, well, that's definitely a part of it that's definitely a part of it i just i, think I meant it more referring than... specifically to like uh, your story is written <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a part of it. The incest part. <laughs> I probably would have left that out. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it it was a bit of a disappoint a disappointment the first time I read it because you know such a downer. I mean, the the ending is and the way things go in the book. But I think all the the things that are good about it outweigh that, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and that's one of the most beautiful usage. Uh, usages of the english language i think i've seen in a fantasy novel and well okay it is a sword and sorcery novel and it's the only one i've ever seen a writer use um elements they're more high fan the more um high fantasy elements like trolls and elves and that kind of thing true yeah true but but, i don't think anybody else could have done that I don't think anybody else could have taken those high fantasy elements, but made this hard as nails sword and sorcery novel with some of those things that were in that novel. And that whole Nordic or Norse Nordic tra- tragedy thing is one of the things that it has this darkness about it that, that is so uh, pronounced that it's, it's sword and sorcery. It's not. It is not high fantasy. Right, and I thought that was an interesting contrast too. Just reading it, where you have all these, like you said, these high fantasy uh, characters or different types of monsters or what have you, but the the story itself is so gritty. It just there's a it's a it's a contrast. 
it is yeah it is very gritty it's, it's a very dark read there's like elements of um of pessimism from valgar just from his existence you know he hates his the situation he's in so much he's a product of you he's, he's just a, a soulless kind of chain he thinks he's soulless you know and he's just a shadow of another man and even his mom his what's after his mother's name Emmerich goes in and creates him you know, he goes in this he's held her captive for 900 years or whatever and yeah she has this little philosophical passage about how your know, life is like, like a rotting flesh on a skull i can't remember what she says but it's actually a beautiful bit of writing there <clears throat> it's just so dark i mean ever the doom is for foretold so that you know it's coming it's not a surprise even to the characters they they all know they're doomed and that's almost okay with them so it's almost not a the broken sword really has everything in it it's like a romance also like a kind of a romance that's you know yeah, like, yeah that's a romance, thick romance. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that it, it's really heavy-handed with that you have to read so much romance and you're like god dang it's you know what i mean like <laughs> And it's the worst kind. So <laughs> it, it's also a dark fantasy. <laughs> like how we said, I think it is sword and sorcery, but you can, if you did want to make an argument, maybe you could call it dark fantasy. Like Carl Edward Wagner said, his books were dark fantasy, but yeah, it really did have it all. I mean, the characters were so interesting. I mean, just the, uh, the writing is so beautiful and, and so visual. Like when, um, Scaflock is growing up being adopted by the elves and all the, learning their ways that there's a passage where he uh he's somewhere in the wild hunt comes along right and it's such a a, a great piece of of writing right there it's so vivid you just like gives you goosebumps you know what i mean mm -hmm. there's a lot of passages like that in there the battle scenes are amazing some of the best little i should have pulled a quote or something because i remember at the end there's this uh I mean, it's got to be the last few pages of the book. It's when Scaflock is dealing death, you know what I mean? And it's just talking, there's just a whole paragraph that is probably the most perfect battle paragraph that has ever been written. Uh, I have to go back, I because I don't want to fuck it up, but <laughs> <laughs> everyone needs to read The Broken Sword if you're listening to this, because it really does have it, everything. It's got like um, a bunch of archetypal things within it. Not it, it is it's like a tragedy in the classic sense. Um, there's also this element of the sins of the father visiting down on his children so hard, you know what I mean? Like they really mm -hmm. bear the brunt of, of his bad deeds. And there's this element of wondering, uh, how much the witch's wrath is unfolded in all these different ways. I mean, she's created so many, uh, butterfly effects, you know what I mean? Yeah. By cursing them, you know what I mean? It's just so interesting to watch it all unfold it, as these doomed characters are playing out uh it's also really interesting that everything exists in the broken sword like they're every european mythology is true right like greek mythology is true it exists the irish sin or shin she joe <laughs> she right uh, are in there um and then it's got the whole Viking thing. And also, it kind of implies that Christianity is also true. You know what I mean? Because everything is scared of Christianity yeah. coming. It moves their end. You know what I mean? So that's a whole other just kind of... It, it's another layer that's j just as important as, and impactful as all the other elements. The book just like has so many multi-layered uh, things that you just... There's so much to... Uh, to enjoy you know what i mean it's a uh, it's quite a book well uh, first of all that i have to commend howie and jason on their description um so accurate so first of all the element of darkness right and i would even call it hopelessness that is from the get-go to the last word in the book um paul anderson was American, but he was children of uh, Scandinavian parents, Danish, I think. There is a Scandinavian darkness to the whole thing. When Scandinavians want to be dark, they they, they really manage it. <laughs> um, uh, and th this hopelessness and this and this, it's like um, um, 
the thing about the broken sword is that it's relentless. You you read words and you go, don't kiss her. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, especially at the end the last yeah, don't, don't, okay no don't do that don't do it dude. that could be the name of the book don't kiss her <laughs> and, yeah, exactly and then it's like the hopelessness grows and you go okay so there's destiny and it's written and you can can't do anything about it so you think, well, I'm just like a mindless puppet in the hands of destiny. So you know what? I'll just call it quits. But you can't because it's destiny. So you can't even get away. That's from... what I, yeah, that, that's basically what I was hitting. And I, I could, I hate that. <laughs> and it's just, it's like, okay, I am who I am. And uh, I have the freedom to do whatever I want and I have to be okay with the fact that uh, someone somewhere a long time ago has decided all of this so are my thoughts mine um, are my actions mine uh, and, and then from there you know he keeps pounding on um, every word is heavy and um, and yeah, the assessment on the on the battle paragraphs. Absolutely agree that they are the best battle paragraphs ever. Can't stop them. Oh. Yeah, they're very, very good. In that in that same vein, just wanted to ask you guys uh, specific moments in stories that stand out. You're not favorite story or anything like that, but maybe a specific moment in a story or a paragraph that you find particularly awesome, you know, uh, an event in a story that you saw play out that was satisfying. Oh, I mean, there are a lot of those. Um, I was just talking yesterday with uh, Matthew Knight, the singer for Colin Bourne. We were talking about some Bram McMorn stories. Um, and I mentioned that uh, battle scene in uh, Kings of the Night is one of my all-time favorite battle scenes. And Howard even remarked in a letter to... Um, to one of his correspondents, probably the, somebody else in the Lovecraft, H.P. Lovecraft circle, about how proud he was of that particular battle scene. But, I mean, that's one of the things. Um, and that's all I could think of right off the top of my head because we were talking about that yesterday. But I'm right. sure uh, Jason and Joe can probably elaborate much better than I can on that. Sort of thing. Well, I can just remember real quick just something that Eternal Champion did that I, because I love this story worms of the earth so it has it's a story that centers around brand back again so you get that uh pictish mythology that no one really knows about howard had such a rich palette to 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 create from you know what i mean with the picks because there's just not that much known. Right. so you get the mystery of the picks and then it has the lovecraftian element in the end of the story it kind of hit me because the brand back goes through such lengths to exact his revenge on Rome and, and, and Titus in this story. And he brings up the worms of the earth, which are the, you know, they're never really described fully, but they're like, you know, horrifying. And they're destroying this Roman legion and they're toppling their towers. And, and Bran McMoran looks at, at uh, Titus with disgust. He's gone mad from everything he's seen. You know what I mean? The, the slaughter and the, the sight of the worms of the earth coming up and destroying everything was just that broke him. And Bran McMoran just is kind of disgusted at what he did. He, he again, he, he kind of evoked this unnatural evil that he doesn't understand this kind of um, sorceress element, I suppose. So that was a, it just kind of jumps to my mind. Like, Oh, that's instantly relatable, you know, going too far. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. you're, uh, and you're, um, and your vengeance or whatever you know, it's not that it, it, it's just uh and it really struck me so much that i wrote a song based on that story so great song you and how we both have great songs about worms of the earth mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah what what jason just mentioned i i recall a line from my my song was called finder of the black stone and mm -hmm. um the the one line that and regarding what you just said that reminded me of was I gave up humanity to crush my foe. 
right right before the chorus so that's yeah. that's pretty much it yeah that that is a really um that story leaves an impression and right. what was the name of the eternal champion song about worms of the earth just called worms of the earth worms okay, okay. Mm-hmm. it was an italian band and joe probably knows something about the Crucis. yes they did a a, a concept album it was the did year they, yeah. After, yeah, the year after I released Anne Rome Shall Fall, they released this whole concept album about Brandon Moore. Really? Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. Wow. What I'll do you know about that band, out. Joe? Uh, we 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 um uh, funnily enough, we played together in our very first show in two thousand two. Um but they were were very well known in Italy. Also because they were one of very few bands that originally came out singing in Italian. Mm. And they uh, their first demo was called uh, Fede, Potere, Vendetta, which means faith, power, and vengeance. And uh, so, yeah, they, they've been like stalwarts of the Italian metal scene. And uh, Worms of the Earth is highly recommended. Very good album. Uh, cool generally some guys anyway so so uh i want to go with the first thing that came into my head because it's, i'm assuming that's always the right answer and that would be um elric blowing the horn and putting an end to it um also because it it, it has it ties in with the general theme of this conversation about sword and sorcery um what one of the very first examples of fantasy literature um um going back to um i think it's the 1500s is uh orlando furioso and and you know elric goes to find the sword of uh i think the horn of uh roland or whatever he does, I can't remember. But there's definitely a, a mention uh, of Roland. Roland is the main character in uh, Orlando Furioso, so uh, has that little Italian mm. kind of connection right at the very end uh, <laughs> of the saga when he destroys the world as he knew it. Because um, supposedly we're in the world after, right? Right. What right. what comes after him blowing the horn is our world. Right. Um, so yeah, that 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 would be it. And of course, uh, Michael Whelan with the with the green painting, uh, you know, the frost and fire cover is kind of immortalizes it. So, yeah, that would we be my Go yeah. on. That's a great answer, uh, Joe. I was just we we were talking about the broken sword. And there's that kind of similarity between Stormbringer, his tear thing, right? The broken yeah. sword. And the way there's... Valgard is killed in the same manner as Elric. It kind of slips from his hand and aims itself at him and, and, and you know, and bails himself. Absolutely. And, and, and yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the broken sword has so heavily inspired uh, Moorcock. Like, I mean, right. it must be an open exactly. thing that he says. Because. First thing I thought of the first few lines, Imric and Elric are not that distant in the right. actually the, the actual way it sounds. And uh, they're kind of elves in the same way, dark elves, kind of yeah. evilish kind of elves, you know. That's right. Uh so if there's uh there's definitely heavy influence. Um but I think he even admits it. I mean I don't think Morco has ever hidden the fact that uh broken sword was highly influential on on the whole elric saga and yeah absolutely the the moment the the way the whole thing ends is total uh stormbringer uh what what does stormbringer say again goodbye my friend i was a thousand times more evil than thou yes that's so good (laughs) (laughs) yep Something like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, gentlemen, we're going up on two hours here, so I guess uh, just to wind down and put a bow and everything, we'll just go around and give you all a chance to plug some things and say what's on the horizon. Uh, Howie, I know you got 
the Sword and Sorcery Heavy Metal series on the Echoes of Crime YouTube. Give us a a breakdown of what you got going on and plan for the future with that. Um, just at this point, I just try to surprise myself every week or so, and and I'm just doing the last um, episode was Matthew Knight and I discussing the Solomon Kane story, The Hills of the Dead. And yesterday we dis did another video discussing C.L. Moore's Hell's Guard. And um, so I'm just going to keep rolling with the podcast. I've got a couple of stories that are going to be published next month. There's a story in uh, DMR books. That, there's a new DMR book series called Dive of the Sword. I had a story uh, in the first volume of that uh, last year that dealt with the Anglo-Saxon invasion of Britain uh, or was set during that time, didn't so much deal with, I mean, that background. It was called um, Secrets Only Dragons Know. I'm sorry, did you want to say something there, Joe? No, not in, in approval. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, and then I have uh, a new, the well, getting around to what you actually asked me there, the uh, next month there's going to be Dive of the Sword Volume Two, and it has a story set during the Thirty Years' War, which spans 1618, 1648, uh, uh, and centered in, in Central Europe or Germany, um, dealing with a knight who's a cell sword who has no name and no memories um, other than recent battle. And he is sent on a mission to rescue a woman accused of witchcraft from the witch prison in Bamberg. This is also overlaps in the Bamberg witch trials with one on in, in Germany. And uh, that story is called Reflections of a Haunted Mind. That's going to be published uh, next month in Dive of the Sword 2. And I've also got a Sword and Planet story called On the Eve of Zerket Bull, which uh, involves a character of mine named Tharg Tynuth. He's like a cat man. He's like this jaguar, jaguar man with tusks and um, they're laser gun battles. And, and of course there's a, it's more of a like a medieval weaponry as well. You know, like a, a, in some ways like a standard sword and planet story, but he was one of the characters from my uh, short novel under a dim blue sun. And uh, that's going to be published in Kursova next month. I, think the date is March 16th when that magazine comes out. And then, of course, um, I'm hoping to be able to record the next Calder Born album this year as well. So that's pretty much what's what's going on with me. How you've been writing, man. Mm -hmm. That's good cool. stuff. I yeah, I love to hear that. Thanks. Cool. Yeah. What about you, Jason? I know you got the Sword Worship magazine going on. What else you got in the... Uh, oh, yeah. Island? We... We just released the second issue of Sword Worship, which is like a little uh, fanzine we're doing now. It was just going to be like a little one-page uh, newsletter for Eternal Champions, since we're not putting out so much like uh, inner workings of the band out on social media, like kind of the more personal stuff. And so it was going to be like a little newsletter. It just kind of snowballed from there into an actual fanzine because we have so many ideas we want to do. So now we're publishing uh, comics and short fiction in it. Uh, Sky Hernstrom, who we should kind of plug here, who's a great writer in the genre, a great modern writer of this uh, sword and sorcery, and might be one of the best doing it, if not the best doing it. So in my opinion, you know, he's great. We got him to do a comic on the first issue, and in this new issue, he's got a short story, and it's kind of the beginning of his new um, alternative Atlantis mm. uh, saga. It's really cool. Um so I hope people pick it up. Well, we we sold out of the first run of them, but we might uh, do another run of them for Hell's Heroes. And I'm just starting to send these out this week, so it's really new. And actually, Sword Worship is something I want to involve you two guys in as well, Joe and Howie, because uh, I like to feature some of your artwork or short stories in it. Because it's really not just about heavy metal. It's more about uh, the inspiration for heavy metal. Mm. So we're gonna, we have some things lined up for issue three and four, which are pretty interesting. So, Well, I'm certainly interested. And in, uh, Just shoot me an email and let me know what you want. I sure will, yeah. yeah. And, Joe, I, you got to get that story published, man, because I've got a taste of it. He sent me the first chapter, and the whole arc of 
of the the monk with the reverse conversion is so cool. <laughs> so I really it's, hope to. It's actually not that original, and in, in that uh, there's a small. It's a short story, or um, it's not a novel by. Uh, I think it's Brian Bates. Uh, the name is uh, The Way of the Weird. Oh, cool. Uh, it's the story of a monk uh, that goes on a missionary. Um, so so he's, he's on a evangelization kind of mission to uh, pagan tribes in uh, Britain and ends up questioning his whole exists oh, wow. possibly kind of performing uh, a reverse uh but i think in the end it is more like uh you know discovering more mystical ways to see the universe rather than becoming out and out pagan um uh but <clears throat> but yeah cool. i, I let, let's say i took that more to the extreme <laughs> yeah i love it though so i'd love to involve you and anything you wanted to do with that. So. Oh, absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll try and do that, especially because I started off um, uh, kind of very heavy handed, a bit inspired by, I don't know if you know this novel called The Name of the Rose. Mm. Uh, yeah. Is it inspired the movie? No. It, it inspired the movie. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. I've seen the movie. Yeah, it's it's really cool, right? The way yeah. uh, you you wouldn't call that fantasy or sword and sorcery or anything, but set in a you know medieval monastery and um, yeah. there's a lot of uh, that w where it becomes genius is that it teases you into thinking there's supernatural elements to right. it, but then in the end, sorry sorry for the spoilers, but there isn't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, cool. there's a lot of uh, the the writer Umberto Eco. Um, is um first of all i think he you know, won the nobel for literature i think but oh, wow. uh secondly he was a semantics professor in university so he played a lot around words and yeah. you know the whole thing is about words in the right. end um but uh so i started off very heavy-handed like that um and then i went look this is not this is not how it should be so in, instead i kind of took a step back I started writing small, short stories, which cool. I think fit the the whole uh, character better. Um, mm -hmm. So I, 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 when I have something reworked, I might shoot off <laughs> a couple oh. of short stories and see what what. I'll, I'll probably submit submit it to you guys first because um, uh, I'm a what's it called exophonic writer, mm -hmm. so a person yeah. that writes in not their native language um uh so you know gotta watch out for grammar <laughs> yeah <laughs> blunders <laughs> the so next thing we're that. working on is the split which joe announced we have a eternal champion is going to do a split with doom sword so that's kind of the next thing we had. we're working on our album as well so we should record it this summer after this little tour we're going on so but that's the thing i'm Really looking forward to is that doing that. I know. So excited. I know. Uh, so behind in the actually in making the whole thing, uh, like finalizing it, but uh, yeah. it's very exciting. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> Jason, you got anything going on fiction wise? I'm trying to follow up the God Blade. Yeah, with a collection of short stories. Again, the God Blade was just. I would never do that again. That's too long. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's a short. It's a short nov novella, I suppose, but really, the short story is the is the ideal format for this kind of thing. And I want to go off and not write about just Rannon. It's got to be about the other characters too, because I know I've kind of kind of done all I wanted to with him. He kind of served his purpose in the God Blade, and I don't know where to go with him besides that. The whole world is changing now after the God Blade, so it's kind of. Um, like the world is disintegrating uh now the breaker's been killed and so mm -hmm. there's all this uh you know entropy is uh sped up and, and the, the followers of the cult are really freaking out because things didn't pan out the way they wanted them to <laughs> and certain gods are dead and some unpredictable gods are still alive 
And so, yeah, I'm kind of doing that. I'm, I'm trying to stick to the short story. So hopefully I can get together five or seven short stories and publish them, you know, and maybe put it all together because, well, the God Blade was really a novella and not short stories because Eternal Champion had been writing so many lyrics referencing the story already that I kind of had to fill the story with so much that right. I had already referenced in the songs. So that's kind of why the length is like that. But from here on out, it's just short stories. I couldn't, I couldn't do that again. I, I must have been write, writing it in like a fugue state or something because I don't even really remember writing. It. <laughs> and I know I was just in my back house, just feverishly like writing it, and then you really, you know, really going at it. I, I must have been in some some weird state because <laughs> so, I couldn't imagine doing it again. Well, gentlemen, it's uh, been a pleasure chatting. Unless you guys have any questions for each other, that's all I got. I, uh, that's I can't. It. Go ahead. No, that's about it. That's about that's it. Okay. Yeah, well, that's, that's all I can think of. Uh, I was going to ask. Um, I was going to ask Jason about that, uh, about the God Blade, and and if he was working on a sequel to it. But we we got the answer on that, and uh, so I I'm pretty much caught up on the news today. <laughs> and, uh, but Jason, yeah, shoot me a, an email about that. Um, I sure will, or whatever, Facebook or wherever. And uh, I'm I'm yeah. definitely interested in in your magazine. Cool, we'd love to have you, man. That'd be awesome. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Great, love to hear it. Thanks. Well, gentlemen, thank you again. Uh, we got two hours here. I think that was pretty good. So whenever I get it edited and posted, I'll send it out to you guys. And I think Howie's going to be posting this as an episode of Sword and Sorcery Heavy Metal as well. Yeah, just let cool. me know how long to sit on it. All right, no problem. It'll probably be about two weeks. All right, that's okay. All right, brother. Brothers, appreciate <laughs> yeah. it. Hey, great talking to you. you guys. Great seeing you. Thank yeah, you guys again. Yeah, good seeing you. You have a great rest of your day. Take care. Absolutely. Bye-bye. See you guys.